excited uh, to introduce, um, actually you've already met him earlier this weekend, uh, Dr. Nabi. He's truly a multimodality imager. He's going to get us started for our final session. Okay. Thank you, Huey. Appreciate the introduction. Um, so my talk today is a little bit about peripheral arterial disease. We've heard some of the surgical approaches. How about how, about how do we make a diagnosis? And um, I definitely will be keeping us on track. So um, I think it's this button, right? <clears throat> okay, so peripheral arterial disease. Now, this is a, obviously a condition that affects a, a significant portion of the U.S. population. You know, if you have atherosclerosis in one vascular bed, definitely puts you at risk for other atherosclerotic diseases, such as coronary artery disease and uh, stroke, and therefore, obviously, is a risk factor for increasing mortality. Uh, PAD, in addition, actually adds to the burden of atherosclerosis by actually also affecting quality of life and by limiting functional capacity. And patients normally present with symptoms of either claudication or, in worst case scenario, critical limb ischemia. Now, how do we make, how is the diagnosis usually initially made? Obviously, patients come to you with typical symptoms of claudication or when they exert themselves, they either have calf or buttock pain. Um, you may palpate their pulses, notice a reduction in pulses in one extremity versus the other. And then after that, you're normally ordering some sort of simple, very simple physiological test that is often done in a lot of physicians' offices. And this includes something like an ankle brachial index, which is simply a ratio of the pressures at the ankle compared to those at the brachial artery. And if you have a number less than 0 0.9, this turns out to be extremely sensitive and specific for making the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. I'm sorry, of uh, peripheral arterial disease. And then you can go further. You can actually add a series of blood pressure cuffs to the a patient's limb. And wherever you see, and we call this segmental pressures, and wherever you see a drop off of about 20 millimeters mercury of pressure, you can imply that that's where the stenosis is located. So we have some very simple non-invasive uh, techniques to make the diagnosis. So when does imaging start getting into play? And as you know, uh, with anatomical, uh, anatomical imaging, there's several different techniques. We have the gold standard, which is digital subtraction angiography, what's done in the catheterization lab. Then, of course, you have these advanced imaging techniques, such as CT and MRI. And then finally, of course, there's also an ultrasound available. So a lot of my talk will be today is about how we can, you know, of course, focusing on CT and MR, but how we can, how we navigate this field with these different anatomical techniques. And really, when is the test ordered? These tests are ordered if your diagnosis is still uncertain based on those, not, uh, those physiological tests, or if your patient is a good candidate for the cath lab is a good candidate for revascularization, then frequently your um, proceduralist will want to know where the stenosis is, how bad it is, in order for them to help plan out a strategy uh, for repair. So it's really when uh, you, know, you order these tests when the patient is a good candidate for revascularization. So let's talk a little bit about digital subtraction and geography. Again, this is a procedure um, physicians like Huey know very well, the interventionalists and Dr. Lumsden. Uh, they take a pigtail catheter to the abdominal aorta. It's an invasive procedure. Place a big bolus of contrast and follow the contrast down the leg. And as you can see from these images, that this is really a 2D technique. It's simply a luminogram, so all you're seeing is the lumen of the artery. It's kind of hard to evaluate for eccentric lesions. Um, and uh, you only have information about the lumen. You really have no information about the vessel wall. What are the risks? It's an invasive procedure, and you're, you're obviously there's iodinated contrast involved, so we have to worry about the kidneys, and then, of course, uh, it requires a little bit of radiation. Um, what about ultrasound? Ultrasound is also an extremely uh, a very good technique, very widely available in most institutions. It'll give you both information about anatomy and hemodynamics. They evaluate these waveforms, and based on these waveforms, you can determine whether a lesion that you're seeing visually is significant or not. 
However, in certain patient populations, it can be a little bit difficult to have those patients who have significant, uh, uh, you know, a big body habitus. It can be difficult to see those pelvic arteries. And then it can be, it can be very challenging in those vessels, uh, in the tibial vessels. They're, they're small, and it really takes, uh, you know, a, a significant amount of uh, a scanning and a really qualified scanner to see those vessels well uh, to make appropriate diagnoses. So that then finally leaves us with the two techniques that I'll spend some time talking about, is which is CT and MR, uh, MRA. And both of these, we consider these, uh, you know, these um, <coughs> are exceptional tests, and I hope to prove that to you in the following slides. Uh, these are tests that, uh, unlike the other tests, are three-dimensional techniques. So we can really spin these arteries around in whatever plane we want to see to, pre to get a true appreciation of what these vessels are like. They have incredibly high spatial resolution. We can see very, very small arteries. They have large field of view, so not only can we see the arterial structure, we can actually see the structures that they supply to make, any, um, uh, to make helpful diagnoses as well. And as the following slides uh, will show you, uh, you know, our image interpretation has really been simplified with a lot of advanced processing techniques that we have, the software that allows us to really manipulate this data like we never have been able to before. And I hope to show you that this technique is exceptionally accurate and really helps our surgeons. Dr. Lumsden showed you so many slides of you know, how these, they use this information to plan very complex procedures. So a little bit about this post-processing. You know, this is all soft, done by softwares. The old way to do things was just to read off your axial slices, kind of go through the tomograms of the body as you go along and make your interpretation. But now we have all these sophisticated ways we can look at arteries. We can create images that look just like angiograms. We can create images where you can actually understand the atherosclerotic plaque. You can spin it around in 360 degrees and uh, evaluate eccentric lesions. So very, very powerful techniques. We can create structures that you know, will help um, the, the interventionists plan their procedure, their stent graphs, see if they have enough landing zones like we had just discussed in the last talk. So very powerful techniques that really allow you now to manipulate the data to get exactly the information that you want. How good are these tests? Uh, this is data with CTA, comparing it to the gold standard, looking for 50% 50, 50 blockage with uh, DSA. And no matter what arterial bed you're looking at, whether it's the um, uh, pelvic circulation, whether it's the femoral tibial whether it's, or the tibial circulation, extremely high sensitivity and specificity in the high 90s for making the diagnosis versus the gold standard. So really, you know, uh, incredibly powerful tests. Similarly, we have a large amount of studies um, also evaluating MRA against digital subtraction and geography, and the results are actually no different. No matter what arterial bed you're talking about, the sensitivity specificity exceptionally high in the high 90s. It's not limited to the lower extremities. This is just data for carotid arteries. Uh, you know, if you look at the area underneath the curve, both for CT and MR, in multitude of studies, they have been shown to be, again, highly, highly accurate for making diagnoses. And remember, this is a non-invasive technique, therefore no risk of stroke um, um, as opposed to when taking the patient to the cath lab. Uh, if you look at the renal arterial bed, this is just data with MRA. That is no different for CT. You know, if you're looking at the renal arteries, exceptionally high. These are big enough arteries. We see them beautifully. We can make the diagnosis very accurately. Uh, what happens when patients have already had prior procedures and interventions, such as patients who have had arterial grafts? This is data for on using CT, and you can see here, um, you know, this is compared again to digital subtraction and geography, and in this particular case to ultrasound as well. You can see here, and I've highlighted in the uh, boxes, that again, you know, whether with two different readers, uh, the sensitivity, specificity for making diagnoses is excellent. So, you know, you're not going to miss disease. Uh, you're going to, these are, you know, you're, these are very, very accurate tests. 
There's actually been a randomized trial looking at advanced imaging techniques versus ultrasound in making a diagnosis um, in peripheral arterial disease patients. And to basically summarize what the findings were from this large study of almost 500 patients, they found that the proceduralist, when they had information, anatomical information with some of the, with the advanced imaging techniques, the interventionalist had higher confidence in making therapeutic decisions. Uh, they ordered for less studies, and this directly translating translated into less cost. So this study, very randomized trial, nicely showed compared to ultrasound that these techniques helped your interventionist make a better diagnosis. So CT or MR, how are we going to decide who's going to get which test? Now, you know, and that's really where the rest of this talk is kind of going to go to. Of course, you know, we have to realize the scenario that you practice in and what uh, modalities you have available to you. But if you were in the ideal situation where you had both tests available to you, how should you go about choosing between these two tests? Well, a couple of things that we consider, of course, are what are the strengths of each test and what are its limitations? What are the individual risks and contraindications for each technique? And then finally, what is it about your patient that may make them have some unique characteristics that can help you better choose between these tests? So let's focus a little bit about CT then. Some of the advantages of CT is obviously that probably not a hospital in this country that does not have a CT scanner available. So it's readily available. These scans are done exceptionally fast. Within less than five minutes, you can practically scan the patient from head to toe. So it's a much, much faster technique than MRA. And then, of course, as we had already mentioned, the spatial resolution is almost down to 0.5 millimeters, and you have a very large field of view, so you can actually evaluate the end organs as well. Um, um, additional strengths of CT are if you know that these patients have already been to the cath lab, if they have known evidence of stents already present, this is a technique that has been shown because you know, CT has no problem with metal. This is a technique that can very nicely evaluate stents, uh, especially large stents. And this is just an example of two cases, one patient with a normal stent, and then another patient with instant restenosis. I've shown you here's data actually evaluating the sensitivity and specificity using CT. And, you know, the, these numbers are almost unbelievable. You know, they're very, very accurate in diagnosing disease. So CT, with metal, especially stents, it's not a problem with CT. Um, heavily calci calcification, you know, this is maybe the Achilles. It's also a plus, as Dr. Lumsden was mentioning. It helps them plan their procedure and, and plan where, you know, where they may have some extra support for their graphs. But for the imager, it can be an Achilles heel. And the reason is calcium causes blooming artifact. And you may have seen that in the coronary arteries. We definitely also see that in the peripheral vasculature. And basically, this is a result of the spatial resolution issues. What happens is the cal if there's dense calcium present, this causes obscuring of the lumen. The calcium looks bigger than it actually is. You actually overestimate stenosis and then may actually uh, you know, have a, a greater degree of uh, false positives. Now, so this can definitely be a limitation in those patients who you expect to have a lot of calcification. This includes patients such as the elderly, obviously diabetics who are known to calcify vessels, as well as those with renal insufficiency. CT, of course, has some workarounds around this uh, that we use to help us get around some calcium, but in general, it can be a limitation. And this is just some images showing you that where you have dense calcium, all you see is the calcium and not the lumen. Other risks with contrast of CT, as you know, we're giving a pretty large bolus of contrast. Um, it requires at least 100, 120 cc's of dye. You have to be careful in those who are prone to contrast-induced nephropathy. This includes, of course, our heart failure patients, our diabetics, those who have renal insufficiency, and of course, our elderly. Uh, there are patients who can have allergic reactions, so you have to be aware of those if they have any prior history of anaphylaxis. Not the best test to use. 
Um, there is radiation exposure involved with CT, of course, although there's been a lot of emphasis now on re dose reduction. And, but this is important to remember, if you have a young patient, you know, may not be the best patient you want to expose, especially since a lot of these patients will need serial imaging, uh, as Dr. Lumsden had shown you when they're frequently, uh, once they've had some procedure done. So for repeated studies, those who are young or pregnant, keep radiation dose in mind. Um, uh, what are some, what are, so that was kind of CT. How about MRA? What are some strengths of MRA? Well, MRA, just like CT, is also a three-dimensional technique. Um, it also has very high spatial resolution. We talked a lot about the diagnostic accuracy with this test as well. Um, it has a couple of advantages, which we'll be discussing here in the next few slides, which gives it a, a unique advantage in certain scenarios. But one of the things I think you'll be hearing a lot about in the future and we're work, working very closely with our vascular colleagues is, you know, we have the opportunity to actually evaluate flow and hemodynamics with CMR using phase contrast CMR. So I think we'll hear a lot about flow and especially flow to the end organs, such as the muscle, and how we can use that in addition to our anatomical imaging in further risk stratifying or further deciding who needs treatment and not. And I think you'll see a lot of that in the future. Um, um, as more and more data is collected in this field. But what are some specific strengths? Well, as you know, MRI is completely blind to calcium. There's no protons there, there's no water there in calcium, so you know, there's, we, 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 have, we just don't see calcium. And that's really helpful, because if you have uh, vessels that are extremely calcified, like these images here on the left, we have no trouble seeing the lumen and making correct diagnoses. With CT, as you can see on the left side, with the blooming, you don't see the lumen. It can be very difficult making a diagnosis of stenosis or severity of stenosis, whereas with the MRA, you actually, what the image that you're seeing is not the calcium, it's actually the lumen of the vessel. And wherever you see abrupt termination, you can be certain that there's a significant stenosis present. Um, other advantage that CT has, I'm sorry, MRI has is um, in patients, we have two ways of creating MR images of the per peripheral vasculature. The first one is on the left-hand side where we actually inject gadolinium contrast and you get a beautiful contrast-enhanced image of the lower extremities. Vast majority of the case, this is our workhorse, you know, we can make excellent diagnoses as I've already shown you. In some patients who have a lot of inflammation in their lower extremities, such as those patients who have chronic limb ischemia, you have early transit of this gadolinium from the arterial vasculature into the, peripheral, into the venous system. And that can create a lot of difficulties with imaging because you'll get images here like what you're seeing on the left-hand side where you, you have both the arterial and venous structures uh, lighting up in the image. And it can be very hard when you're interpreting because you're not sure what is artery and what is vein. But one of the beauties of CMR is you actually, some, in a lot of, we have now sequences, and I will show you some of those, where you do not need contrast. You can, you can put the patient in the scanner, no contrast given, and I can create, just based on flow principles, I can create an image of the vasculature without giving them any gadolinium. And that's what you see on the right-hand side of the screen. This is with time-of-flight imaging. You can, I can look at the, uh, these tibial vessels, again, completely without contrast. So if, as the operator, if I'm there and I've given contrast to a patient and I give it, get an image, something like on the left, I can quickly switch to my non-contrast imaging, the time-of-flight, and I can create, I can still have a perfectly acceptable study. So a very, very powerful trick we have with CMR. And this, I think you're going to hear a lot more about, and it's already hitting the literature now uh, extensively. We have a new sequence out there. It's called the Quescent Interval Single Shot or Short-Term Kiss. This is a non-contrast MRI technique. Here is a beautiful couple of beautiful images comparing it both to CT and digital subtraction angiography. This is a complete non-contrast technique, head to toe. And look at the diagnostic accuracy compared to um, CTA. Um, you know, in the high 90s, um, both sensitivity and specificity. 
So, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, compared to digital subtraction and geography. So a very, very powerful test. We are employed in our own labs here. It can be done completely without contrast, it can aid you in your interpretation, and is very, very accurate. A, very, a, a, new, a, a new technique that uh, you'll hear more and more about. Uh, what are the Achilles heel of CMR? Everybody knows metal, 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 right? You've always had patients who've had pacemakers. You can't put them in the MRI machine. And so it's no different with stents. And stents, unfortunately, metal creates this, uh, it's, you know, you just cannot, it creates this, it, it affects the magnetic field. You have a complete loss of signal. And here in this image, in the renal artery, and then the uh, common iliac artery, you just see complete absence of an image. You have no idea whether that stent is patent or not. Uh, you, there's no way to interpret it. There's just a complete absence of image. So if you have patients with stents, you know, MRA will not be the best test for evaluation. Uh, what are some other limitations? Well, despite its extent, excellent uh, diagnostic accuracy, it does have a slightly uh, smaller spatial, re uh, small, uh, sorry, lower spatial resolution than CT, and therefore you may have a little bit of difficulty with smaller vessels and may actually overestimate disease. Um, you don't have the bony landmarks that frequently Dr. Lumsden needs to, uh, to plan these very complicated graft procedures. And then this is a longer study. They have to be able to lie comfortably underneath the scanner, be patient, wait about 30, 45 minutes to complete these scans, especially if we're going to be doing multiple techniques, including contrast and non-contrast. Um, other limitations are we've talked about metal, which includes stents, but these patients often have other implanted metal devices. Uh, these includes pacemakers and ICDs. A lot of institutions don't scan with those. We in our institution have protocols in place where we are scanning. So for us, it's a relative contraindication, but a lot, I know a lot of sites where you may be at may not want to scan these patients. Um, and then of course, there are patients with pumps, uh, be it you know, and uh, infusion devices or metallic clips in, clips in their brain. They're not good candidates for MRI. Uh, there is the risk with gadolinium administration in those patients who have GFRs less than 30 uh, of this nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. We feel now that this risk is significantly reduced with the use of our, uh, with the now more common use of our macrocyclic agents. So, uh, but it is a risk that we have to be aware of. Very rarely, much less than iodine, there is a risk of allergic reactions with um, uh, gadolinium. Um, um, yes, so, you know, if, if you've noticed that, that we have a problem, there's a patient population who we don't have a good test for, and those are patient populations with GFR less than 30 because they can't get iodine and they can't get gadolinium, um, and the, uh, GFRs less than 30 who are not also on hemodialysis. What do we do for those? Well, those patients, we have a few options. We have ultrasound. We have these non-contrast MRA techniques. But we also have this technique that Dr. Lumsden uh, mentioned as well, which is the use of ferromoxetol. Ferromoxetol is a iron-based paramagnetic um, agent. It is actually indicated for iron deficiency anemia. But it has paramagnetic properties, which we use to our advantage. And it produces images just like what you're seeing on the right-hand screen. So it can really salvage us when we, we have limited options for a certain patient population. Um, so just to start and conclude now, um, you know, if you look at the guidelines, these advanced techniques are recommended. When your anatomical imaging is recommended, when your patients are headed for revascularization, when you're choosing CTA, consider it for better patient acceptance, rapid acquisition, higher spatial resolution, stent evaluation, when you need anatomy, uh, soft tissue and bone information, and those patients who have metallic devices. Consider MRI when you need, non, when you need both contrast-enhanced and non-contrast-enhanced techniques. When calcification is a problem, remember it is less nephrotoxic. It's both radiation-free and an excellent technique for re uh, repeat imaging. Um, there, you, you should know your local expertise that's available to you. Consider CT in patients who are critically ill for stent analysis, for patients on dialysis, small vessels, and those who have implanted devices. 
Consider MRA when uh, considering function and flow for repeat exams for those who have heavy calcifications, such as diabetics and renal patients, those with iodine allergies, or if you see an indication for ferromoxetol. Uh, there's nice tables out there. You don't have to remember this. I've left it so when you access the PDFs. There's tables out there that can help navigate your individual patient. And I'll just leave you with these two cases done from our own lab. Uh, this was a 64-year-old who had a long current smoker, left internal carotid artery stenosis, who comes in with claudication. And I hope what you'll appreciate, if we start with the right-hand side of the screen, you know, all the uh, femoral arteries, popliteal tibial arteries are completely normal. But if you look in the abdomen, starting in the, in the infrarenal abdominal aorta after the SMA, there's a complete absence of the aorta. So this is also known as Lariche syndrome or aortoiliac occlusive disease. And um, uh, this is, you know, not, you know, it, it's, a, it's quite an amazing picture when you see it. And what you're seeing on the sides are all the collaterals that are going to the lower extremity uh, from the uh, 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 per uh, peritoneal vessels. So quite an impressive picture when you get to see it. And then finally, what Dr. Lumsden said, you know, we do a lot of patients who have stents. We use CT for these because of the stents. We're looking for complications. We heard a great, so a great talk on that. And here's another example of an endo leak. So uh, just some take-home points. I think I ran over, so I'll just let you all read that. <laughs> <laughs>